Good morning. My name is Suzanne Chambers. I'm the Executive Dean of Health Sciences at the Australian Catholic University. But the reason why I'm talking to you today is that I'm also a psychologist and a nurse, and I've been working for many years with men with prostate cancer and their families. And I currently have the great honor of leading a Centre for Research Excellence in Prostate Cancer Survivorship. So I'm pleased to be able to talk to you today about life after prostate cancer, particularly thinking about survivorship and about psychological wellness. So I'm going to overview some psychological aspects of prostate cancer, discuss helping approaches and give you a bit of a sense of what sort of work we're doing at the moment uh, with our centre in collaboration with the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. So all of you listening who've had experience of prostate cancer, whether yourself or someone close to you, will know that the experience of cancer is a major life stress where you worry about your survival. How is my life going to change? Am I going to feel like the same person? Will my relationships be affected? And all these things prey on people's minds and make this a pretty difficult experience. If we think more broadly, um, we can think from a survivorship point of view. A person is considered a cancer survivor from the moment of diagnosis onward. And so that includes the man who's diagnosed with prostate cancer, but it also includes his partner or whoever is close to him. We've been working very closely with the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia in developing up a framework for prostate cancer survivorship. Um, and this is just a quick picture of that for you. The piece here that I want to focus on with you is the idea of evidence-based survivorship interventions, what things will make a difference for your quality of life, vigilance, what things do we need to watch out for, and personal agency. How can we help you be more in control of the situation in which you find yourself? Now, the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia has materials on this that they can uh, provide to you in more detail, but just very quickly, Personal agency means patients, men, are aware about what they need and know how to get the help that's required. Evidence-based survivorship interventions means that anything you do to help yourself, you want good evidence that tells you that if I do this, it's likely to provide me with a benefit. And vigilance is about keeping a close attention, not just to your physical well-being, but also to your psychological well-being, so that if you need some help or support, you know that you can reach out for that. Now, this is a book that, um, that I have written, and it was launched in February this year. And I've got this up early. The, uh, the royalties for this book go to the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia to support cancer research. But I put it up there because I think it's a, it's a beautiful image of a man who's looking forward to the future and what might happen. And the whole idea of this book is about self-management and personal agency. So many of the things that I'm going to talk about are things that people can do for themselves. And Facing the Tiger gives a hint and guidance about how to do those things. So I will be presenting to you an approach to psychological well-being that's very much drawn from this book. Now, there are many challenges you face with the diagnosis of prostate cancer. First up, just getting diagnosed can be quite traumatic and then having to make decisions about treatment can be very confusing. Getting through the treatment, then coping with the side effects and getting on top of those, and then facing life ahead, which will be changed in many ways because of the treatment. These are just some of the challenges that occur, but many of you may have experienced other challenges as well. So it's a very much an individual thing that depends upon the person who has the cancer, what their situation is from a family and a social point of view, and what other things they have to manage in their lives. It is pretty common after any cancer diagnosis to feel anxious, to be sad, sometimes to feel quite angry. And initially when you find out about the news, it can feel quite shocking. Um, even if you've been having investigations, you're still somehow not expecting to get that news. And so that can be quite a shock for people, feeling tearful, perhaps withdrawing and not wanting to talk to others, and sometimes just feeling confused because the load in your head about all the things that you're trying to come to terms with can really be quite overwhelming. This is what I think is a nice model that explains the stress response. And the reason why I put that up is that it gives us a hint that when we're in a situation where we have a major life stressor, in this case, we're talking about prostate cancer, there are things that go on within us that influence how we react. There's the way we think about it. 
there's our physical reactions to the, the thoughts that we might have. There's the actions that we do to help ourselves in the situation. And all of these things will influence our feelings. The importance of knowing all those pieces is that we can address it and target each of those circles with different strategies that someone can help you with or that you can learn about and you can actually do yourself. But I really wanna make the point that everyone is different. So there'll be things that I'm talking about that you might say, oh, that's exactly how I felt or what I thought. Or it may be that you go, no, nothing like that. I was quite different. And I just want to say there's no one right or wrong way to cope with the cancer. We all do our best. And the important thing is not being like everyone else. The important thing is being flexible and being kind to yourself. Same for partners as well as men with prostate cancer. So I propose the toolbox approach, which says that there'll be lots of things going on in your life and each of them might need a different tool. So that's where we get back again to the idea of flexible coping, trying one thing, trying another and being open to, to doing different things to get you the result that you want. So the tip is use a range of coping strategies to suit different situations. There are some times when closing your eyes or imagining you're somewhere else just to take you away from the stressful situation can be a really good thing to do, but it's not such a good strategy when you're trying to understand treatment or discuss with your partner what's happening to you. So strategies aren't good or bad. They just can be used for different purposes and you need to be flexible about them. And experiment. If you have been using one strategy and it's not working for you, look at different ways of coping. And a balance. Don't rely too much on just one main way of coping. So constantly avoiding thinking about something is just as unhelpful really as constantly confronting and engaging with an issue. The whole aim is to be flexible, to experiment and to have a balance of different strategies that you can use. How you think is important. The way you think about the situation affects how you feel. We all have a tendency to have automatic thinking patterns about things. Some of us are catastrophizers, immediately imagine the worst. Some of us are black and white thinkers. It's got to be one thing or another. Um, these are kind of inflexible ways to think. So you've got to be a little careful with yourself sometimes and just keep an eye. If you find that you're feeling very anxious, what's going on in your head? Are you thinking about things in an overly pessimistic way? Are you blaming yourself for things? Are you imagining things that really are unlikely to happen? We tend to do these types of thinking patterns all the time, and mostly they don't matter. But when you're in a situation like coping with the diagnosis of cancer, then that is when it's useful to be aware of what's going on in your thoughts. Not because, again, you're doing things right or wrong. It's just that they will affect how you feel. So you can notice what they are and perhaps gently challenge those thoughts to be a little more realistic and a little more helpful. Or just notice them and go, you know, it's natural to feel that way, but I'm not going to treat that thought as a fact and I'm not going to react to it. And then turn your attention to um, other things. I do find in the work I do with men with prostate cancer that there are some things that they do that increase their feelings of impatience and upset. And so being aware of this, knowing the tendency, whether you have a tendency to react in this way and perhaps trying to manage that. So underestimating how long it takes, the length of time it takes to return to full physical stamina. I sometimes talk to men and they'll say, I'm this many weeks down the track, Suzanne, and I really expected to be back to my usual feelings of strength and doing the same things. And that's just not realistic if you've had a major operation. So I often have to remind men, just take a breath, realize what you've been through and give yourself a chance to recover. Catastrophizing about what may go wrong is a common habit. So trying not to imagine the worst. It's not a good idea to return to formal levels of activity too quickly unless you, until you are really ready and your doctor says go. And not recognizing or praising themselves for the gains that they've made. So when you've done a good job of getting through a difficult experience, a good pat on the back is a really good idea. Now it's important to not ignore feelings of stress. One way of thinking about stress is it's like the foot's on the throttle and it's flat out. And you know, if you did that to a car, you'd wreck the engine in the end. So you can't treat your own body the same way. If you ignore feelings of stress and tension, it, it makes you more tired, you lose your sense of stamina, 
it's distressing and it can strain relationships and, and relationships that are normally uh, pretty easy going or very strong can start to feel a bit tougher when you're ignoring stress and you're finding that you're getting up tight a lot of the time. So there's lots of strategies you can do, relaxation strategies that reduce physical and mental tension and they can be um, deep breathing exercises, meditative type approaches, going for a big walk, taking the dog for a walk. Uh, doing things that are enjoyable and that focus your mind or distract you from worry, like playing music, um, going out for golf, uh, tennis, reading, whatever are the things that you find enjoyable and that help you give your mind a little bit of a rest from thinking about the cancer. Exercise is crucial. Exercise reduces fatigue and distress. It improves your sleep improves overall well-being, it helps with bone density, and it helps keep weight under control. It's a very good stress management strategy, and it's good for your longevity and your overall well-being. So I think it's really important to discuss with your doctor about what level of exercise that you're doing, and if it's insufficient, doing something about that. It's a good idea to see an accredited exercise physiologist in many situations to get an exercise prescription that is absolutely worked out for what your needs are. And this is particularly important for men who are on androgen deprivation therapy. Um, you can also talk to your physiotherapist about this, but important, of course, when you're having treatment to get guidance from an expert on what is the right level of exercise for you and what you're going to be able to manage, particularly if you have other musculoskeletal issues or, or joint problems that you need to be careful of. Now, I want to mention partners. I'm thinking there's probably some partners listening today. And it is a fact that partners often report higher levels of distress than do the men. Um, so what I would say to you is the experience of cancer is a family experience. And so if the man is distressed, the partner is going to be feeling that as well. You really affect each other and tend to bounce off each other in most relationships. So this is at this time that it can become more challenging to communicate. And you might be having to communicate with each other about things that you wouldn't normally have an open conversation about. We all know that changes in sexual function are very common after prostate cancer treatment. And even for couples who've been married a long time, that can be a difficult thing to talk about and difficult to get the perspective of the other person and to work together and problem solve that. So I always think it's important for partners to know they're having a challenge here as well and really to try and work on the couple coping together as a team. If you do have a partner, you can support each other through this. If you don't have a partner, that's where in particular your other friendship networks and other members of the family will be really important for you. It can be a very lonely experience going through cancer treatment. So really a good idea to open yourself up to the people around you who can help and support you. And if you don't feel like you have people who can do that for you, to be connecting into the services offered by the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, their support group networks, all of those things, there is always someone there that you can talk to, whether it's a nurse at the PCFA or it's another man who's had a similar experience in the prostate cancer support group movement or another partner who's in the movement. There is always someone to reach out for. Very important, as I said before, for couples to work together as a team, Try not to mind read each other. We're always sure we can read each other's minds, but really it's important to check out assumptions you might be making and to share with each other what are the things that you can do to help each other get through this experience. Trying not to be focused on cancer all the time, being flexible in how you approach things and sometimes just take time out just to have fun and remind yourself and remember to do the things that bring you joy in your life. I mentioned support groups before, they're very important. And support groups provide what we call peer support, which is talking to another person who's had an experience of cancer and who can really share with you a unique perspective. As a psychologist and a nurse, I can talk to people about what I know about prostate cancer and my point of view. But there is really nothing like getting the point of view from that personal experience, someone who has been through this experience and who really knows what you might be going through from a personal level. This is just a quote from uh, one man that I was chatting to about his experience as a support group, where you can see he was saying the range of experiences available was really helpful. 
getting the opportunity to look at things in a different way um, and really coming up with different responses that you can try out that you may not have thought of. And that's just one example of the types of things that can happen at support groups that are so very helpful. So just back to the survivorship framework again, this is exciting work being led by the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. And what we're really hoping is that we can get this out into the community. There is a, a, a care framework document coming with that. And we're working very closely supporting the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia in this work and working with your clinicians, your urologists, your radiation oncologists on how can we make this a reality for you in your world. So that's really all I wanted to talk to you about today. It is important that you let your clinicians know how you're feeling. We talk a lot in the field about the idea of distress screening, which is um, a little simple test that we do where we ask someone to say on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is no distress at all and 10 is the most severe distress, what number would you be? And it gives you a way to gauge just where you're sitting. We know that if you're four or above on that little test, but there's more talking to be done about figuring out what is happening with you and getting some extra help potentially from a nurse or from a psychologist or for, from your clinician or ringing up the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. That's a tool that health professionals may use with you. But I think I raise it just at the end of this conversation to say to you, it's important to notice if you feel you're not doing so well and it's really important to reach out. It's normal to feel this way at times. And so reaching out and getting the help that you deserve and that you should have is a really important thing. So thank you for your time. I wish you well in your conversations that you are having through this virtual meeting. And I look forward to a time in the future when we'll all be able to do this together face to face. Thank you.